address. So this is one of our favorite things to do, and I see a lot of my students in there as well. So yay, happy to see you all. And if you are, and I'll say this again, if you are one of uh, here with, uh, because your instructor told you to come in, um, be sure you take a picture of your view and send it to your instructor just to let them know that you were there because at least in my class, there might be a little something special added on to your grades. I'm just saying, because you're going to learn something. And that's one of the reasons why. All right. So uh, really quick, we'll do some introductions. I'm Professor Montessarchio. I teach accounting here at Broward College on Central Campus is my normal campus. But right now, I'm officially remote. So who's next? Dolan, there you go. Hi, I'm Professor Dolan, business. I teach accounting on Central Campus also. He copies me, I'm just saying. You both copy me, and I'm <laughs> Professor Applebaum. I teach accounting and taxes, and I'm at the online campus. Hello, I'm, I'm Ryan Davis. I teach uh, economics on South Campus. Where's Helena? Professor Yaman? I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> This, I'm Dr. Yaman, and I teach uh, economics and uh, real estate and property management uh, now remotely, obviously, but uh, on South and on Central. Okay, so getting started. Is there anybody else? I didn't miss anybody. We, we were going to have Professor Fennick, but I'm going to throw him under the bus for any of you guys that do know who he is, <laughs> because he bowed out gracefully like he always does. He, that's why his nickname is called Slacker, so in case you ever see him. You can tell Miss M said that you're a slacker. I know Jeannie's here. I don't know if she wanted to introduce herself because she's one of our favorite people on campus as well, but she may be a, like behind the curtain over there, so. I am definitely behind the curtain. Nice <laughs> to meet you guys. Uh, this is Dr. Krista, and I am also teaching remotely. It's good to see some of your faces, though, so I'm glad that you're braver than I. <laughs> All right. So let's talk. We're gonna, this is supposed to be more of an interactive sort of uh, 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 seminar here. So navigating your future life after graduation and now, even currently. So we're going to talk a little bit about money management and the future goals. And I'm going to go quickly because I know everybody has a, enough to talk about. So hopefully one of these areas is going to be of interest to you. Credit uh, cards and debt, taxes, budgeting and banking. And we all have our own little parts, so investing in real estate. So we have some experts in the room in these topics. All right, so beginning with uh, Professor Dolan and Professor Davis, they're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Budgeting 101. Um, if you guys need co-hosts, if you're going to show any videos, if they don't work or if you need me to, just let me know. Or uh, Stephanie will give us um, co-hosts for you as well. Okay. All right, so yeah, budgeting. The first thing in, that you have to do is, is to budget and to see where, where is your money going? So one of the um, types of budgets you could use is the 50-20-30, where it's 50% towards your essentials. This is pretty much like your fixed cost every month, your mortgage, your rent, your car payment, your insurance, the electric bill, the water bill, you know, those fixed costs that every month, you know, that that bill is coming in. That should be 50% of your budget. And Professor Yaman will probably even tell you about housing. You probably don't want your housing to be more than 35% of your monthly income, because at that point, you're going to be in trouble in terms of making your other, other bills. Then 20% should go to savings. And out of that 20% towards your savings, you probably want to do like 10% towards your retirement, your 401ks, your IRAs, and then the other 10%, you know, if you want, if you're trying to buy a new house soon, you save for that. If you want to uh, go on a vacation, save for that. The emergency fund, probably one of the most important things for you to, to do, save for an emergency fund. And then you have 30% for your personal expenses, going out to eat, clothes, the gym, stuff like that. But no matter what, the first thing you want to do is see and record what you're spending your money on. And I'll, I've done this recently. Amazon is killing me. And it's <laughs> $25 here, $25 there. You know, I want to get a new tool on Amazon. 
my wife ends up getting a few shirts. We need to get something for a kid. The dog needs some new food. And all of a sudden we spend $500 a month on Amazon. And it felt like we didn't spend anything at all because it was just $20 here, $40 here. So when you budget, you're like, well, wait a second. Um, where did, where's this money going to? And that's why you want to, you probably want to take about three months of your, your last, last three months and kind of just see where, where you're spending. So some of those bullets, uh, make sure your needs are covered. Of course, again, that's that fixed cost, manage your debts and savings and avoid overspending. Me and my wife, we just kind of did our yearly budget. We're going to try and cut down Amazon spending. Um, so once you evaluate your current financial position, you're, you're tracking the spending for three months, you then are going to start setting your goals and, and creating that budget. So instead of spending $500 a month, we're going to try and spend $200 a month on Amazon. We can't cut to zero because that would be impossible, but we at least want to, to lower that to a degree. In terms of, of your, your savings, you need an emergency fund. That is the first thing you should do is make sure you have that emergency fund. Um, recently, um, Kathy, I don't know if you could uh, put up that article, the $400 one. I, I could share it as well. I have it pulled up, whichever is easier. There you go. So um, every couple of years, the Federal Reserve will send out a survey and ask Americans about their emergency fund, about their emergency savings. And the last time they read the, ran this report, they found that 40% of Americans don't have $400 as an emergency fund. $400. This, this is, you get a, a, a nail and a tire and you need to get two new tires and an alignment, that's $400. This is not something that doesn't happen. This happens to me every few months where a, a tire gets busted, I need to fix a water heater, something happens where I need to have $400. And 40% of Americans don't have that. So your emergency fund, at least start off with making sure you have that $1,000. Jose, I think I, I saw a hand go up. Yes, uh, you just answered it. So. Oh, I answered it? Oh, okay. Thank you. So, of course, you should start off with just $1,000. And then your other personal finance gurus, they'll tell you you need to save, you know, three months of your monthly expenses. Some will say six months of your monthly expenses. But again, it probably depends upon your job. It depends upon your, your income, um, you know, some jobs are more secure than others, but generally the rule is between three to six months. I think Susie Orman has just come out and said, now you need a year worth of emergency fund because of what we just happened with COVID, uh, but usually three to three to six months. Um, Kathy, could then you pull up that, that other uh, link with the personal savings? So, you know, I'm getting really good at Zoom now. Thank you. Away Blackboard collaborate. So here, here's the personal savings rate uh, that the Federal Reserve uh, has tracked. And you can see it's, it's tracked for, for a very long uh, time. And you can see the, the spike with, with COVID, where a lot of people saw that uncertainty and they started saving a lot of money. Um, now, again, we're not spending as much, which is hurting the economy now, but before COVID, you could see Americans weren't saving 20% of their money. The average American had a savings rate, yeah, as, as you could see, it's about 7%. That is, that's not good enough. We need to be saving more. And if you see, credit cards really took effect in about 1980, 1980s is when the credit card for the average American started to kick in. And you see that before the 1980s, we're saving at 10%, 12%, 15%. Since now all of us have credit cards, we were saving at six, 7%. Not good enough. As Americans, we all need to save more. And that 20% is a really good number to shoot for. 10% for retirement, 10% for your other goals and your future. All right, uh, next slide. 
<clears throat> so here are some, some money apps. And I, I think even in the chat box, a couple of you um, mentioned uh, the Mint app. So that's, that's a, a, a terrific one. Uh, you, you need a budget.com. That's, that's a really good one. But these again are just some resources that you guys could start to use to start to track your budgets, start to track your, your spending. And the last thing I want to mention, yeah, cat the perfect time, yeah, <laughs> right into that select, that you want to start as soon as possible in terms of savings uh, because you want to take advantage of compound, compounding. Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it, he who doesn't, pays it. Albert Einstein, really smart guy. And he was just amazed by the magic of compounding. So we're just gonna watch this, uh, like the first two, three minutes of this uh, Dave Ramsey video on compound interesting. And it'll tell us, it'll show us <clears throat> the importance of starting early. I can't, I can't hear it. I don't know if anyone else can. Audio. Okay, how do I do it to make it so it goes on? I told you I was learning. Is it in the share? So yeah, usually Dr. M, if you click share, um, I don't know if you'll have to stop sharing to re-engage, but you have to share the screen with the sound. So you'll okay. see when you do that on the, go ahead and click share screen. And if you look before, after you select which screen you want to share on the very bottom, it says share sound. Let's see if this works. Ready? Talking about, it's a mathematical explosion. Einstein said that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Now, compound interest is simply this. You take your money down to the bank. Let's take this $1,000. And we take it down to the bank. And we put the money in the bank. Now, you leave it there. And it earns interest. And you leave the interest there. The next year, you earn interest on the $1,000 and on the interest. The next year, you earn interest on the $1,000 on the interest and on the interest, and you leave it there again. The next year, you earn interest on the $1,000 on the interest on the interest and on the interest, and then you leave it there again. That's what compound interest is. The trick with investing is you got to start, and you got to start right now. You got to get started. So we're going to get the thousand dollars out of the way. We're going to get the emergency fund built as quickly as we can. We're going to get you out of debt, and then we're going to get you investing as fast as we can in these baby steps, because time needs to be on your side. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's look at Ben and Arthur for a minute. Ben starts saving money at 19 years old. He saves two thousand dollars a year. He does that all the way up until age 26. At age 27, you will notice Ben puts in zero. Say zero. zero. At 27, he quits putting money in, but he's got, the, he's got the pump primed. The snowball is there. It's starting to roll down the hill, and every time it rolls over, it picks up more snow because it's a bigger ball each time it rolls over. Then his brother Arthur on the other side, he looks up and says, ooh, ooh, Ben's saving money. I need to save money. He starts saving money at age 27. Now, let's fast forward all the way to the end of the story at age 65 and see what happens. What happens is, at the end of the story, Ben has put in $16,000 and has ended up with $2,200,000. Arthur, who put in $78,000, only ends up with $1,500,000. The guy who put in $78,000 later ends up with $700,000 less than the guy who put in 16000 earlier. Some of you are looking at that and going, that's a real nice chart if I was 19. <laughs> well, let me tell you this. If you're in here and you're under 25 years old and you grasp what I just showed you intellectually to the point that it drops from your brain into your heart and changes your behaviors, I just made you a multimillionaire. You shouldn't be allowed to graduate from college or high school without being able to explain that chart. It would change America if people understood that chart. So that's it, guys. 
you, if you understand what he just explained and you start saving for your retirement now through a 401k, an IRA, and let that compound interest be your friend, you guys will all be millionaires and uh, have a, a, a nice retirement instead of eating uh, rice and beans every, every night for dinner. Well, I want to jump in for one second because, you know, if you've taken my class, you know, this is one of my favorite books ever. Anybody see this? And it talks about what he just said, The Richest Man in Babylon. And yes, I read it every single year. And it's told a little story. And it talks about how your money is like you have children. And then the interest has grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a very short read. And it's out of copyright. We all know what that is if you took accounting. And you can get it for free as a PDF, so you don't even have to pay for it on the internet. So The Richest Man in Babylon, make sure you read it. It's just a short read. It'll literally take you an hour. And it teaches you how to learn to live within your means. If you make $550 of it gets put away and you learn to live under $450. So next is... Bowen? Hey everybody, I'm going to talk about FICO scores. So first, um, just to give you a little overview of it, um, the FICO credit score ranges between 300 to 850. And as you can see on here, I have um, a down on the bottom, I have a credit scores YouTube video that I'm going to show that's going to give you a little description about what we're going to talk about. Um, but first, I want to talk about how we can go ahead and report and prove and the impacts of our score have an impact on the future. Um, and also we're gonna talk about protecting your identity going forward. So the first one, which we're not gonna click on, I'm just gonna give you an overview of it. And it's from a Forbes article and it talks about um, how students, um, and basically 70% of college students um, damage their credit just after graduation. Um, and I'm going to give you just a couple stats just to support where they're talking about the 70% uh, percent of college students. So they say 51% of students miss at least one credit card payment by 30 days. And this is just after graduating. Um, the second part is 44% never miss a payment. And then we have another stat that says 30% have a delinquent utility account and it's basically sent to collection. So it's way beyond where it should be. And then they say that we should also be able to maintain a high credit score and credit utilization, and it should be below 30%, which in the YouTube video that I'm gonna show you, it's gonna give you a little pie graph and it's gonna explain in detail what we're referring to as far as your credit. And then 58% of grads exceed that amount. So that 30% that we're supposed to stay um, below, they say 58% of grads exceed that. So that's a high amount of numbers or percentages um, as far as graduating from college. Now they say that most students that enter college have minimal knowledge as far as how to pay bills, how to save money, and also how to maintain a budget. And they say basically that's um, the main part of you know getting older and creating a healthy financial future. So one of the things that we lack is learning how to do those small little minor things. So if you can play the um, YouTube video, the second down, Montessario, and it's just a it's it's about a three and a half minute video. So if you can just um, watch it real quick and it'll kind of give you an overview of what I was just talking about. You have this one up on your screen? I do. Can we give her so she can do that because I don't have that one available. She does, yeah, they're all co-hosts. Okay, so you can share your screen. You have to stop sharing yours first. Can y'all see it? Okay. Nope, no sound again. Professor Dolan, so if you wanna stop sharing and then... Wait, where do I go again? Sorry. So stop sharing and then reshare basically, or just click share screen because you can, at the very bottom when you click share screen, like scroll all the way down, there's this little box that says share sound. 
um, on the sharing screen. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so if you hit share screen, select the screen that you want to share, but before you hit the blue share button, all the way on the left-hand bottom corner, there's an open white box that says share sound. Got it? Okay. Okay. So let me start it over, sorry. Credit Cards 101 and Loans 101, her next step is simple. Understand her credit report and score. A credit report is straightforward. It's essentially a detailed history of your credit, covering everything from your payment history to the age and status of your accounts, as recorded by the three major credit bureaus in the United States, TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. As you can imagine, this is quite a lot of information for anyone to process. So, one company actually created a simple way to summarize this information called a FICO credit score. This is a calculated number between 300 and 850 that summarizes your credit report. The higher your score, the lower the interest rates and the better the rewards you'll get from banks. Plus, a high credit score is also vital for a number of other things, like getting affordable insurance, finding an apartment, or even qualifying for a cell phone plan. Ironically, for such an important number, Getting your credit score actually used to be quite difficult and expensive, but now we recommend a website that makes it free and easy for you to get your credit score and report online. This is great for Jasmine, but she's still confused about one last thing. What exactly makes up a credit score? Well, a credit score is actually made up of five components, and from understanding each one, you can derive the four major ways to improve your credit score. Part 1. Payment History 35% of your score because this is such a large number, it reveals the importance of paying every bill on time, even if it's just the minimum. If you're struggling with this, we highly recommend setting up automatic payments for everything, especially your credit card. Part 2. Credit Utilization 30% of your score To avoid damaging this, we recommend not exceeding more than 30% of your maximum credit line, both total and for each individual account. If you're struggling with this, try paying off your balance early a few times a month, or Try asking your bank for a credit line increase. Part 3. Length of credit history, 15% of your score. The existence of this component means, rather counterintuitively, that you shouldn't close out your old credit card accounts unless you absolutely have to, as otherwise you'll hurt your credit score. Part 4. Recent inquiries for credit, 10% of your score. This one's simple. Don't apply for new credit cards and loans unless absolutely necessary as each credit inquiry will slightly lower your credit score by a few points for the next 12 months. Finally, Part 5, Types of Credit Used, 10% of your score. Unfortunately, we just don't have a rule for this one, as we don't recommend applying for multiple types of credit just to boost your score. Finally, before we conclude, we just have two more things for Jasmine to keep in mind. One, to build a credit history, and thus a credit score, you need to use credit and the easiest way to do this is to open a credit card, like a secured or student credit card, that are designed specifically for people with no credit history. And don't worry, we teach you everything you need to know in our two videos, Credit Cards 101 and How to Rebuild Your Credit. Two, be sure to check your actual credit report for mistakes at least once a year, as these errors can dramatically affect your credit score. Should you find one, be sure to contact the credit bureau as soon as possible. Hopefully you and Jasmine now better understand how credit scores and reports work. Be sure to check out our next videos. Okay, so can everybody hear still me? <laughs> hear me still? Okay. Can you put back up the PowerPoints? So that was basically the um, credit scores and how they are um, coming together so that everybody can see with the pie graph, the five different areas. Now, here are your three um, different credit bureaus where they do the reporting. Um, these are just some little um, ones that you can get your free credit report from. So we put them in there for you if you're interested in using any of those. Next slide. And you get one free per year, no matter who you are. You should always check it to make sure anything's open or closed. And then the last part is improving your credit score. <clears throat> As they said in the YouTube video, you want to pay your bills on time, 
You want to make sure that you keep credit and other revolving credit balances low. Um, we always recommend that you use cash um, and then you can apply and open new credit card account only as you need them. And then most important, you want to pay off all your debt rather than moving it around. Um, sometimes the credit cards will offer you incentives as far as moving your credit, I'm sorry, moving your money to another, they'll give you a lower interest, ends up just you're constantly in this battle of moving it around. And then at the end, your high score equals your lower interest rates, low score equals your higher interest rates. And that's all I have. Mona Sergio? My turn. So I'm going to be quick because I know you guys all want to see, uh, hear about taxes in real estate. So really quick, savings and checking. You know, every one of us thinks that we are the brightest person on this earth, and rightfully so, right? And when we look at our online banking, we can look at it and say, oh, yeah, I made that transaction, no doubt. The reality is, do banks make mistakes? Yes, they do. Do vendors make mistakes? Yes, they do. Is there fraud? You know, my F word, fraud out there, there is. And I can tell you one really quick story about my sister and I, Dolan, went to get a manicure and a pedicure, and we went to an establishment, and we saw that they charged us. And, well, funny, it, within the next week, there was a second charge. Now, most of us just look at it and say, oh, we got charged for it, not realizing that it happened to go over two different months so it showed up on two different credit cards and the assumption was, yeah, I did it. But the reality was they double billed and that's a big problem here. Jose, do you have a question? I see somebody with a question. Uh, not necessarily with a question, but more of an example that goes along with what you said. Share. Um, I sent four money grams to Honduras after they uh, got hit by these two hurricanes because that's where I'm from and I had to go to Walmart to do it. And when I check my account, I have six transactions instead of four. And each transaction was about $400. So I had to contact the bank who told me to contact MoneyGram, who told me to contact the vendor, Walmart, and finally reached a solution. But that's how I can tell that the bank made a mistake, MoneyGram made a mistake, and the vendor made a mistake at the same time. So um, what, what, thank you for sharing. And what people don't realize, I'm reaching over here right now, what people don't realize is, yes, Computers do most of this for us, right? Everybody, the computers do it, it's fine. But if you ever have looked and done an actually printed, I'm not a green person, I'm sorry. I like a hard copy of a bill and I like to look at it and analyze it. And that's why they call us anal accountants, right? But I like to make sure that whatever I have on there is actually what was recorded. And you know why? Here's the second part. It's your money. And nobody else is going to look out for your money except for you. So if you would, make sure you just print it out and look at it. Check things off. Keep the receipts. Reconciling your accounts is critical. And it's your money. The second part I want to talk to you about is Investing 101. I know. Let me see your show of hands. How many of you have Robinhood, Acorns, or Stash? Any of you? Some of you do. A couple of you. Okay. I'm not thrilled with Robin Hood right now after the whole GameStop scenario and I didn't like what they did and they put us, you know, low men on the totem pole in the back corner and let all those other guys take over because we all read about that. So I'm not happy with them. But if you don't have one of those and you don't have the best credit score and things like that, can you still do things to save money? Absolutely. So I'm going to show you this little thing and it's called a drip. A DRIP is called a direct reinvestment plan. Uh-oh, something's happening. So the direct reinvestment plan, let me cancel. I think I might be stuck. Uh, a direct reinvestment plan is basically, let's see what comes up. Holy but surely. So it's, you're taking a certain amount of money and you're investing it in with a company. And you're gonna take, $20 or $30 or $40, and it's your way of taking that 10% of your income and investing it in a company that you know. Why is this important? Well, I mean, these are all companies. I did this when I was first out of school, Amazon some, um, AMC movie theater. I did Home Depot. And I'll tell you, by doing you know $50 a month and an accumulation of money that you learn to live within your means, 
you could probably in the next five to 10 years accumulate enough money to have a down payment on a house. So the directory investment, let me see if I can find the other one because I think I had it up. One second. Uh, this one. This is my favorite site, you guys. If you go here, if you want to learn about investing, who doesn't want to learn? You all do. Go to the kids section. Learn from the kids section. Learn and understand what they're saying here. And just give some examples. So let's just take Home Depot. I do this with my classes. So some of you guys have seen this before. And let's say that you're going to invest 10 shares and you're going to put in $50 a month and you have, I don't know, let's just say you have 50 years to retire and then click submit. So let's see how much, well, you're going to invest $32,000 over the next 50 years or the value, but you'll have $1.2 million at the end by just consistently putting that $50 away. And like Professor Davis said, the power of compounding and letting it run through. They have, there's the power of compounding. Here's stock investing for kids, the starter portfolio. Learn from the kids section if you're not sure. You can graduate. I always say in my classroom, you all know Kim and Connie's kids' names, but you don't know how, what the power of compounding is, and that's a problem for me. So use this site. It's amazing. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. And mortgages. Now, Professor Yeaman is going to talk a lot about buying and selling and what you need and everything else. But what I want to show you is one of my favorite things. And again, I do this in my classroom. Here's an amortization schedule calculator. If you've never seen one before, this is fascinating to me. So aside from taxes and insurance, if you bought something for $165,000, condo, house, whatever, 30 years, this is what your payment would be. Now, the fascinating part about this is this is the amortization schedule. So let me just scroll down a little. You can see here's your first payment that you're going to make. Look at how much is going to the principal versus the interest. Does anybody else find this fascinating? It's actually not even fascinating. It, to me, it's more sickening than anything else. But let's scroll down for 30 years because here's the total interest you're going to pay. Ready? Let's scroll real fast. Fast forward 30 years, and here we have it. That's how much you're going to pay in interest over the life of this loan. You borrowed $165,000, and you're going to pay almost $136,000. You're paying back the 165 plus the 136,000, the principal plus the interest. And the last thing I'm going to show you, because I'll leave this and we'll leave these links up there up, up for you, is let's add an extra payment. Let's say instead of going to Starbucks or instead of you know um, going to Dunkin' Donuts or wherever, let's just add $100 every month. So instead of your payment being $836 we add $100 a month and apply it. So if you recall, we were at 30 years before. Now we're, at, we're down by, I think it was like seven years, I think it is. But look at the difference in the total interest paid. You pay, you saved yourself over $30,000 just by making a little extra sacrifice payment to your mortgage payment. And, you know, Wendy Williams is my favorite. And I always say, in my mind, like she says, this is how I see it. Whenever I see a payment like that and I want to pay it off faster, immediately I'm adding money to it, sacrificing where I need. And it's one of the reasons why I can brag. I paid my house off in 16 years as opposed to 30 years. So it's an amazing feeling. So on that note, um, I think, Jose, did you have a question? Did you have a question? Questions now. I can't see the chat. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't... Um... I didn't mean to, I meant to put my hand down because it's more like a later question. I just wanted to know if like all websites and the PowerPoint presentation and seminar recording will be available to students. Yes, because we're so good at our jobs, we will have that available for you. Thank you for being great at your jobs. <laughs> all right. So then we have, that's my money management. And up next is Professor Applebaum. Ready? He is the guru for taxes. Well, I don't know about that. Um, I want to try to share my screen. And it says this will stop everybody else. And 
you share that and do this. And now you should see some, some girl running across the beach. Um, I, I got to go back to two things from Ryan and Kathy. Um, they, they both talked about putting money away, leaving it there for a long time. And Dave Ramsey did a great video and he, he's a, a marvelous speaker, but I can't see what he did on that screen. So while Kathy was speaking, I made this little spreadsheet and it shows somebody starting off at 20 years old. Are those numbers big enough, Kathy? How's that? Can everybody see that? Good. So it sh shows somebody starting off at 20 years old with zero money in the bank. And history tells us that if you invest your money in the stock market with a reasonable uh, financial advisor, that you'll earn eight and a half percent a year for the for the entire time that you invest. So I'm going to use eight and a half percent interest. You put five thousand dollars away when you're 20. It earns four hundred and twenty five dollars. Then you have a balance of five hundred uh, five thousand four hundred and twenty five. That's your beginning balance next year. Now, Dave was talking about the guy who put away early and the guy who put away late. I'm going to be the guy who put away early. For the first 10 years, I put $5,000 away. Now, I'm going to hide all of these so we can just see the end. So you can see at 34 years old, I have $128,000. And then by the time I'm 62, I got $1.26 million. And to show you what happens if you keep on putting the $5,000 away, that $1.2 million turns into $2 million. So this is the way you become rich because you're probably not going to win the lotto. Uh, you might marry rich, but you probably don't have a rich uncle who's going to leave you millions of dollars. You got to Or you stay. could divorce rich too. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm not going there. So you got to save, you got to put this money away. And by the time you do retire, you can have a lot of money. The other thing that nobody said anything about was 401k matching. I see a lot of my students go out and get jobs and they offer 401ks. And um, most 401ks and companies, they'll match a certain percentage. That is free money to you. If you don't put in that savings and you don't take that match, it's just like saying, oh, I don't want any money. So when you get your first job or if you have your job and you have a 401k, please, 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 if you're not doing the max, which is what I think all of us would recommend, at least do the amount up to what they match. If they're matching four or five, six percent, do that match. Okay, so. That was the fun part. Um, taxes are not fun. Taxes are pretty difficult. So um, the, the first thing I wanted to talk about was know your dependency status. And I, these are my notes. So uh, this, is, this is nothing, um, this is my, my sloppy handwriting. Um, I see too many students, and I'm going to gear this to you 22, 21, 20 year olds. I see too many students go out, file their, their first tax return and screw their parents up. Because when you're under 24 and you're a student, either you can claim yourself or your parent can claim you. And there are a lot of things on each of your returns that this can affect. So real quick, I just wanna go over and know your dependency status. So um, if you're a dependent, you can't be claimed by somebody else. So if somebody else claims you, if your parent claims you, you can't claim yourself. You only get one claim. Uh, if you're married filing joint, somebody else can't claim you. There is an exception. There's a lot of exceptions in tax law. So if you are married filing joint and you're getting a refund, your parents can still claim you. So if you're young and you're married and you're just filing to get a refund, you need to talk to an accountant or a CPA or a tax person. Uh, you got to be a U.S. citizen. And the relationship, this is interesting because um, your parents can claim a son, a daughter, a stepbrother, a sister, a half-brother, a sister, or if you guys have kids, they can claim a dependent of you, a descendant of you. So uh, it's, a, it's a vertical 
uh, uh, relationship there. Uh, you have to live with your parent for more than half a year. Now, this counts if you're living away from home, okay? So if you're at school like my kids, I get to claim them, but I didn't, and I'll tell you why. And here's the big one, the age test. For your parents to claim you, you got to be under 19 at the end of the year or under 24 and a full-time student or disabled. And then the last one is, you, the child, can't provide more than half of your support. So if you're earning money, put it in that savings account. Save that money. Let your parents support you. Don't tell them I said that. But let your parents support you. Okay. I know those rules are crazy and hard. This is why before you file a return, you need to talk to mom and dad if they're supporting you to try to figure out where the best place for your dependency exemption is. And this year with the stimulus, it makes it even crazier. So I'm just gonna talk about the American Opportunity Credit, which is an education credit, which all of you um, probably uh, qualify for. So in your first four years of school, you can get a credit on your tax return, it's $2,500, and it's 100% of the first $2,000 that you spend. And it's 25% of the following $2,000 that you spend for a full amount of $2,500. Now, in some cases, 40% of this, which is $1,000, can be refundable, which means even if you didn't reduce your taxes, you can get an extra $1,000 back. I don't think I have enough time to go into all these rules uh, to be um, eligible I, I have, as a student. I have one question, Mr. Apple sure. Um, well, two questions, actually, from what you were talking at the beginning. So um, I was already going to mention that I always speak to my parents before we file taxes because I'm 22, but I also earn money. Sometimes my mom earns more. Sometimes I earn more. So it's always important. It's, you mentioned that already a little bit. It's important to speak to my parents when filing the taxes because I'm 22 and independent before making a final decision, right? Okay, and then the other question I had is, can dependents be non-family? For example, I have a girlfriend who's been living here for uh, over a year. Okay, so this, what I put up on the screen is for kids. There's a whole nother set of rules this relationship part, um, there's a whole nother set of rules if you're not one of the vertical descendants. So uh, girlfriends, other family members, other friends, people you just support, that's a whole nother set of rules, which is a, another meeting on another day. So okay. you got to read those because this is, this is directed just to college students. But yes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, you can and there, you can claim if you're living with a girlfriend and you are supporting them and they don't make over uh, $3,400 and they're a U.S. citizen and they're not filing a return and you paid more than half of their support and they lived in your house for more than half the year, you can claim them. But all right, cool. Because my brother follow the rules. I mean, that, and I did that off the top of my head real quick. I might have been missing one or two of the little rules. I um, hope that helped. Uh, but back to this uh, credit. So all of you are probably paying for school. So there's some kind of a credit. The thing with the credit is the only person who gets to claim this credit is the person who is taking the dependency exemption. So if mom and dad are taking that exemption. They're the only ones who can claim the credit. If you're taking that exemption, you're the only ones who can claim the credit. These credits phase out down here at the bottom if your income goes up. So if mom and dad are making over $180,000, you might want to talk to them and say, hey, mom, you guys make too much money, but we paid for school and I made a little bit of money. And if you don't claim me and I put the exemption on my return, I can get this education credit, maybe get some extra money back. So it's, it's really a tangled web 
And you have to look at both returns, mom and dad and the, and the, and the student to see who does what. And there are reasons uh, not to claim somebody as a dependent. Uh, I think I'm going over my time. Um, I did wanna talk to you about um, free filing, okay? So I know taxes are difficult. Um, this is the IRS website, very easy, irs.gov. And they have this file your taxes for free. So if you click on that and you come down here, they say, pick your options. So if you make less than 72,000, and if you're in school, you probably are making less than 72,000, you can click choose a, a free file offer. Now I gotta tell you, these are uh, companies that prepare software for a living. They want your money. And so this is like a fishing expedition for them. So you click on this and you can browse all the offers. I'm gonna do one real quick. And you can see that uh, here's uh, Tax Slayer and TurboTax and they got all of these different ones. Um, they tell you uh, when you can file for free, but then if you have something like uh, you, you traded some stock or you had an education credit, if it's not an easy, easy, easy return, they're going to want you to pay them. So you can put in here that I made $15,000, my age is 22. I'm not eligible for the earned income credit. I wasn't in the military and I lived in Florida. And then you apply the filters and it tells you which one of these you can use. Now I, I put somebody who is eligible for a free offer and they, then you can click on here and do the free offer. And they go down and they, they show you, here's the frequently asked uh, questions. Um, but it says, is your adjusted gross income under 72? Are you under 51? you're not eligible and you weren't military and then you qualify for free. So just be careful because when you start putting your information in, you might think it's free, but as you go through and put your information through there, it's not free. A um, Couple of other little things that I just wanted to say um, about filing your taxes, re tax returns. There is something called a statute of limitations of how long the IRS can come after you. Okay, not saying that anybody would do anything bad, but there's three years from the date you file the return or the due date of the return, whichever one is later. And after that period, the IRS is not allowed, unless you're a criminal, they're not allowed to look at that return anymore. So one of the things I recommend to everybody is file a return, get that period closed so that the IRS can never come and look at you for those years again. Um, even if you're just making a little bit of money, file it because you don't wanna have a letter from the IRS two years later, three years later, four years later saying, oh, look, you didn't file this year and we see this little bit of income. Um, maybe there was some other income that you missed and now we can come and audit you and, and, and make your life miserable. Um, I, I don't recommend doing your taxes on your own unless you know that all you have is a W-2 and maybe some bank interest because there are so many different credits. Like this year we have stimulus. Oh my goodness, I forgot about stimulus. So how many of you guys got stimulus checks? Raise your hands. I don't see anybody. I only see professors. Um, okay, so I can tell you this morning, I talked to a, one of my, my clients and he makes a good living. Um, he claims both of his kids who are both at, uh, were BC grads and are now at Nova. Um, he claims them on his return last year. Uh, but this year, each of the kids filed their own returns, claim their own dependency exemption, not because they worked, but because if they filed on their own, they could get stimulus checks. And each one of the kids got an $1,800 refund because dad didn't get the stimulus, he made too much money. And because they filed their 2020 returns, each one of them got the first and second stimulus payments of 1200 and 600, and they're gonna get the $1,400 one. So this is a real reason this year, please talk to your parents, talk to a tax advisor, talk to somebody who knows how to do this stuff, because just by filing a return this year, if your parents didn't get it and, you're not getting all these education credits and other things that are helping your parents, 
you might want to just file a return so that you can get that stimulus check. That's another crazy thing. Uh, I have a, another question. I wanted to know if I'm a BC student and I work for the school under financial aid work study program, will I be able to use that to file for my taxes? Uh, so you just told me one itty bitty bitty piece of your whole financial life. So you're going to get a W-2 from Broward College. Okay, so even though it's under financial aid, I should get a W-2 still. Um, Because that's, that's the only thing. I don't know how they pay you. I would I'll, ask, I'll ask my supervisors. They pay me two times a month on the 15th and on the 30th. So it's bi-monthly. Did you um, get a W-2 for 2020? I just you started gotten it back in. I just started this February, so I don't know. Oh, okay. Can I ask uh, do you get a pay stub? Uh, yeah, I get I get paid through workday. So okay, so look at your pay stub, and there's going to be taxes taken out. Okay, thank you. And and they'll give you a W two at the end of the year, and yes, you will be filing. If they if there's withholding, then you're probably going to want to file so you get a refund for that withholding. Okay, well, guys. Okay, better you have Thank you. If you have more questions, for, uh, I just want to get through Professor Yeaman, and then we'll have a Q and A right after. Is that okay? Everybody good with that? Thank you. <laughs> Let me keep going. Professor Yeaman, are you there? Would you like to turn your camera? I'm trying. I don't know what's happening. It's happening. <laughs> um. Yeah. Don't know. It's just I'm clicking on it. I'm not really good with Zoom, so don't know why the can oh, there it is, start video, sorry about that. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So I, I just wanna reiterate in the in the three minutes I have. <laughs> that, yes, you have more than three minutes. You oh, have I more do. than okay. three minutes. Jose, I know I, I, I lied to you about this, the end time. So, but in any, in any case, yeah. Um, your credit score primordial. I go through this all the time with customers, even qualifying for a mortgage. It's just uh, really, really important that you protect your credit score. You want to make sure that you're using credit every month um, and you're paying it off every month. This is the best way uh, to work. Um, you will, when you go to buy in certain communities, you will have to have a background check. Um, we do it through a realtor tool called Rent Spree. It's going to pull your background, uh, your credit, uh, and your eviction check. Uh, to make sure that everything's good. And when, when we have that trifecta, it's so wonderful to see clean credit, uh, good credit, you know, generally above 700 is, is desirable um, and, um, and also necessary for financing. To buy a condo, you have to have at least a 680 credit score. Uh, FHA, you can go lower, you can go down even to 600, uh, but you're gonna pay with interest rate. The better your credit score, the better the interest rate you get for your mortgage. And of course you have to have a down payment um, or rather we're talking here about renting. You have to have three months of rent saved plus whatever association application fee. So even if you're renting an apartment for uh, say 1500 a month, uh, you're gonna need $4,500 plus whatever it costs to apply to the association. That's a lot of money. So you do have to save and spend going back, uh, save going back to um, Dr. Uh, rather Professor, um, Davis's comments. Um, can you? Yeah, thank you. So um, if you're going to buy uh, as a first time buyer, and even if you haven't bought within the past three years, uh, there are some good options for you. First of all, uh, if you're using an FHA loan, you use an FHA loan uh, with 3.5% down, you can purchase. You do need closing costs. Usually closing costs are like another 3.5%. So if you're going to buy a $300,000 house, uh, you're talking about over $20,000 in down payment and closing costs. Now, sometimes we can get some closing costs from uh, the seller as a percentage when we negotiate, but this, this real estate market is smoking hot. I had four closings last week. I will tell you that offers are coming in at or definitely above list price. Uh, there just are not. There's just not enough inventory on the market. A seller's market is where uh, you know the seller controls because uh, there there just are not enough houses or enough condos on the market. So we're experiencing that now with a condo. Even though condos are cheaper, a lot of times you have to come with a bigger down payment. 
For conventional loan, it's 5%. You have to have a stronger credit score. In many communities, you have to put 20% down. So that, that even for a $150,000 condo, think about it, that's $30,000 just in down payment. Now, we, we do have available to us through the Housing Foundation of America um, and through the different, uh, the county runs 31 programs for down payment assistance. I just closed on Friday with a customer who got $30,000 from the city of Margate. So I'm very familiar with these programs. You have to have 3% yourself, uh, but the cities, depending on which city it is and when they get money, uh, they will provide the rest. And you should work with someone experienced on that. I know a lot about it. So I've been, been through the ringer with it. So um, it's, it's a good, good program, a good way to get money. As long as you hold the property for 15 years, that becomes free money uh, for you. If you sell before, it depends on the municipality. It might be a prorated. It's like a sliding scale, how much you would have to pay back uh, to the city. Um, so the, there are those down payment assistance programs available, but you still have to mortgage. So as you're going through the process to purchase, even before you start, you should go to a mortgage broker and say, am I qualified? Um, if you're using down payment assistance, you have to use a, a qualified uh, mortgage broker, meaning qualified by the county. I have that information for you if you want it. Um, and then once you get that pre-qualification where they're going to ask you for tax returns, paycheck stubs, they're going to pull your credit, again, where your credit score comes in. Um, once you get that, then we know what to shop for. Then you talk to a good realtor about, uh, you know, what do I want? And we'll see if your expectations are in line with the market. You know, the average single family home in Broward County is probably over $350,000. So, uh, you know, there are some condos I know about where you can go with three or 5% down. There are some other options, down payment assistance, but this is something to keep in mind that if your dream is home ownership, you need to be saving uh, some money. Um, save that tax return money if you get it back. I know the IRS is running very behind because of COVID. They were shut down for four months, but when you get that refund, put it aside for your little housing funds, you know. Um, so the actual process, when you go out to buy, you go with your realtor, you tell your realtor what, what you want, and they will send you automatic emails, or they'll, uh, they'll uh, make some uh, decisions and choose some properties to show you. You'll shop around, you'll make offers. Don't be afraid to make an offer, because God knows you have 10 days to cancel. Uh, during the inspection period, you can cancel for any reason. You don't even have to do an inspection. So really the key, a lot of people get scared. Like, I don't want to make an offer on this property because I don't really know, blah, blah, blah. I don't know everything about it. Well, you have a due diligence period, seven to 10 days that we write in. Standard on the contract is 15. Nobody gives that. Seven to 10 days, you, you, you can figure out everything. Do I like the association? What are the rules? Um, you know, do I really like this neighborhood? Whatever it is, you have time to think about it. So make your offer. Let's say your offer gets accepted, then you go through due diligence. Your realtor will help you to set up an inspection, uh, wind, four points for your insurance, and a full condo or full home inspection uh, if it's a single family home or townhome. Uh, once we get through the inspection items, sometimes some things come up that we negotiate on, the seller has to fix, because they can become insurance issues. Uh, cosmetic things, probably less likely you're going to get anything in this market. Uh, but during that period, you have time to cancel. So if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You know, I never get upset about that. I'm, you know, again, you know, your, your realtor should be like, cool, you don't want it. Let's move on to the next one. Um, and so uh, through this process, once you, you settle on the actual property, we get through the inspection. Uh, then we go uh, through, we're also going through at the same time, the title process. The title company is looking at uh, the, uh, the deed to your property that you're, you're trying to buy, making sure the chain of title is clear. Uh, they're securing title insurance. They're looking for open permits, liens, violations, all those things that have to be re resolved with the city. Um, I always make sure I write that in in the additional terms that all permits will be uh, expired or open permits will be uh, closed prior to closing. The closing is when we get to the actual end of the process where you, the sale takes place. So there's a title process and of course you're applying for your loan and you're going through all a bunch of different things with loan application and approval process uh, and appraisal is ordered. The appraiser doesn't get to talk to you or talk to the seller. The only person the appraiser talks to is the, uh, usually the listing agent on the property. 
uh, who can provide some comps, but the appraisers, uh, they have a lot of power. They can uh, give thumbs up or down to the sale because let's say you're willing to buy the house for 300, but the appraiser says it's only worth 280. Well, who's gonna pay the difference? You, the seller, uh, the seller's gonna lower. Um, doesn't happen as much in this market. I did have it happen with a small condo the other day, a few, few weeks ago, we did close because I convinced the seller who was not my customer, I had the buyer to lower. Uh, the couple thousand that the, the appraiser said was over. I, you know, I, I disagree with him because in this market, honestly, we have New Yorkers moving down, trying to get, uh, it's like escape from New York. It's like a, you know, a, a Kurt Russell movie or something like that. Um, you know, they're all coming down here. The Canadians aren't coming, but we do have a lot of competition from people coming from states that are very closed uh, down to South Florida. So a lot of competition for property. So, you know, uh, those, once we get through title, the loan, uh, all the inspection processes, then we go uh, to, you know, you're getting approved by the association. You have to fill out an application for that if there is an association involved and an approval process. And then we, we come to the end to the process called closing, where we go to the title company. Um, you know, during the process, you're giving a deposit in the beginning, and then you have to wire your final funds, and everybody's happy we go to close. Uh, so if you want a, a longer version of this and you have more time, <laughs> what are your thoughts on VA home loans? VA home loans, Benjamin, are awesome uh, because you don't have any um, closing costs up front. They do put those on the back end of the loan for VA, and you also don't need to come with a deposit. The only thing I always look for uh, with VA loans, first of all, you have to have a clear WDO, wood-destroying wood organism, so we need a termite report. I always get that from the inspector. Uh, if I know we're doing VA, the appliances have to be there. They don't have to be there for any other type of loan, FHA or conventional. Uh, the house is in pretty good condition uh, for, for a VA loan. So other than that, I think it's wonderful. If you have that benefit, you got to be a fisheye fool to not take advantage of it because you, you, you know, you're getting something where you don't have to have a down in which we, those don't exist anymore. You know, back in the rock and roll times of 2006 they did, but they don't exist really anymore unless it's, it's a hard money loan. Um, and even then, probably not. Uh, so if you can, you can do this. Yeah, Benjamin, go ahead and, and give me a jingle or you can, you can uh, email me. I'll give you my email address here. I was just gonna say, um, maybe we can all put our email addresses in and if they have any further questions that can be answered quickly. We only have about another two minutes to go before our Zoom times out. So I, I personally want to say thank you to Stephanie Rapaci, which you know I'm bummed about you. I'm not even going to go there. Um, and Alan and Ryan and Helena and Mary uh, Dolan. So um, really quick, does anybody have any quick questions or anything? Thank you very yeah. much, Kathy. Oh, um... oh, no, sorry. Go ahead, Jose. Oh uh, yeah, I was just uh, you told me to remind you about the um, what link was it? Oh, the so here, the, um, to the bottom. Um, and I'm pretty sure. Uh, we, oops, I lost my screen. Uh, I can probably grab these links and put them into the chat for you. Will that work? Um, yeah. Or, or is is there a way I can reach this PowerPoint presentation? Uh, I can send you this one. I can give it to uh, Stephanie if you'd like. Let me just grab these though, so we have them, and that way you have them really quick. I put my email in the chat if that helps. Okay. Boy, that would that would help very very much. I I also just wanted the link for uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Ryan Davis was talking about it. It was the Fred St. Louis Fed org. So maybe uh, Professor Davis, whichever ones you had, you can just grab and just stick them in there just so everybody has them. And she, I know that this is going to be recorded. So, uh, yes. and I think I was just going to grab what you guys can do whatever you like. And I'm just going to make this a little smaller. But Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Emma is doing that. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much because I know people did mention Ben specifically. Thank you for bringing that up. If you're here representing on behalf of a student organization, this was a keyword event for your spring engagement portfolio. So the, in order to get points for today's program, your keyword is taxes. 
So go ahead and like I said, and write that word down and be sure to enter it into your engagement portfolio. I know those of you that represent central uh, clubs or student organizations, we actually gave you the Google form link um, at our most recent general assembly last Friday. So you can start to go ahead and plug in all those keywords all from February and March and any other photo evidence that you have for the points program. Um, just make sure to stay tuned throughout the month of April and close out the, those handful of programs as well before you go ahead and submit for points um, on April 19th. So thank you so much, Ben, once again, for bringing that up. And yes, taxes, Michael. Taxes is the keyword for today's points program. Um, but on the subject of thank yous, obviously, I, I personally, before we close out the program, I want a huge thank you um, not only to the faculty who have repeatedly partnered with Student Life um, from the Business Pathway and really all pathways who have been extremely collaborative um, with our area, but I do want to do a shout out specifically to um, the associate deans from across uh, the Business Pathway from those three campuses because they have been also very supportive of lending us their subject matter experts. Um, which has um, just been a huge benefit to student life and I think to students as a whole. So like I said, for all of you that are representing, so Alan, Kathy, Mary, Ryan, Helena, and I don't know if Jeannie is still on, um, but um, just wanna say a huge thank you really from the bottom of my heart and from my whole team in student life um, who have been able to partner with you on not just on developmental workshops, but many of you still currently or have previously also served as student organization advisors and that is a voluntary role. And so for that, I also thank you. I am very sad. I know as Dr. M mentioned, I'll be transitioning out of this position within the next few days, but I have so much enjoyed my seven years with you all. Um, and I'm very, very happy that this is one of the programs that I got to close out with in my final week. So thank you all once again. All right, and then last thing, if you guys, if you're in my class or in one of your other professors, just make sure you take a screenshot now before you go and make sure you send it via email in your D2L and let them know that you did come because most faculty will give you a little, you know, a couple of points extra credit or what have you just to, just because you showed up and learn something. All right, awesome. Thank you all so much. We'll go ahead, we'll, we'll stop the recording and you all are welcome to log off. We hope you have a beautiful day and an awesome rest of your week. Bye.